Welcome to Redeeming Missions, a podcast from Every Home for Christ about the complexity of Christian missions and evangelism in our time. We host conversations that will challenge us through unique global perspectives and honest stories. Redeeming Missions is a podcast for ministry leaders, passionate evangelists, and the rest of us who might be a little bit more cautious or even disenchanted with the topic. Together, we're on a journey to find the heart of what it means to carry Christ to our world. I'm your host, Tanner Peak, and I'm so glad you're joining me today. Greetings, friends. What you're about to hear is a conversation with one of the more interesting people I know. I think you can probably all relate. There's just some people that when you sit across the table with them or you sit face to face with them, they, they stretch your imagination uh, about the world. They're interesting. Cleopas Chitapa, the man that you're gonna hear in this podcast, is one of those people that every time I sit down with Cleopas, I feel like my mind is blown uh, with the perspective that he brings, the insight, um, even to, for, with Cleopas in this conversation, his insight into the Word of God. He is a rich, rich wealth of information. Cleopas oversees, on behalf of the Ministry of Every Home for Christ, over 50 nations across Africa. And being a leader at that level means that he has insight into what God is doing all across the, the, the grand continent of Africa. So that's one of the reasons that I, I just, every time I sit with Cleopas, I'm learning something new. I'm seeing something new that I haven't seen before. We were down, actually this podcast was filmed down in Brazil. To, we were down there to celebrate the 60th anniversary of Every Home for Christ ministry there in Brazil. And we're sitting on a side hill. There's birds that are gonna be screaming in the background. There's ants crawling up my leg. It was a wild experience, but it was, it, was, it was amazing to be able to sit and talk about what God is doing in the global South, specifically in Africa, and to do that from a, a, a place like Brazil where God is just moving so spectacularly. So I hope that you uh, love this conversation. I hope it stretches your mind and your imagination. Redeeming Missions is brought to you by Every Home for Christ, a global network of local catalysts, inspiring and empowering the church to carry Christ to everyone, everywhere, in every generation. We have teams in over 155 nations partnering with local churches and believers to make sure no one gets left behind or overlooked. Because the good news of the gospel is for every person on earth. We're not just doing this for the numbers. We're here for the body of Christ worldwide, and that includes you. Every single believer is uniquely called to carry Christ to our world, and it's going to take all of us. Find out more and join us today at everyhome.org. Well, welcome to this edition of Redeeming Missions podcast. I'm sitting here at the Oikos Center, which is located some miles away from the metropolis area, Sao Sao Paulo, Brazil. I'm sitting here with a friend from Africa under a mango tree. I'm surrounded by red ants crawling this way or that. That very well may be an issue at some point in the podcast. And there might be some interference from birds and other creatures. But I'm so excited to be here with my friend Cleopas. Um, He's coming from Zimbabwe and is meeting us here. We're actually meeting here for for some meetings. But um, Cleopas, I'm... I'm so excited to have you on this podcast. Well, the joy is mine, man. Uh, this is also my first time to come to South America, so it's really no way. Quite, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, quite an eye opener to to be here and to see what the Lord is doing and to see the beauty of God's creation. So, and I persuaded you on this first yeah. trip to be on a podcast, so uh, <laughs> we're lots of firsts here going on. I know. <laughs> well, I Cleopas on on all of these podcasts at yeah. the beginning. I'll start out by asking our guests to just share a five, 10 minute version of their story. And the yeah. truth is, from my opinion, that's <clears throat> oftentimes some of the very best uh, content, the, yeah. the, the most exciting things for people to hear. Yeah. Um, and so I'm wondering if you would just be willing to share a little bit of your story, your journey, what, what yeah. brings you to this part of your story? I know that's hard to condense your story into five, 10 minutes, but. Yeah. Well, uh, I think it's, 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 it's an amazing thing sometimes when you think of the fact that 
there is God, the creator of everything. So when we were driving from the, from the airport this morning, I, I, I looked around and I was laughing, saying to my wife, huh, how did they steal all the seeds from Africa to plant our trees this part of the world? Because wow. <laughs> it looks like everything we have, including these mangoes, you would find them in every neighborhood on our part of the world. Wow. A lot of the plants and the, uh, the, the vegetation, the shrubs and trees are very common, even the ones that we have equally so at home. The hedge that I see even on this facility, we grow the same thing at home. So what does that evidence to the, a supreme being? Somehow there is a creator because I know that we didn't come here and do some gardening years ago. <laughs> so, so clearly, yeah, Africa the, didn't come, no, we didn't plant come. these seeds. No, 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 no. no. That so makes sense. I, 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 I always come to the thought of realizing that at the end of the day, it takes a lot to doubt the existence of a supreme God who is maker and creator of everything. Yeah. So this is the kind of environment that I, I, I rise from where I was born in a culture which would not really contest the existence of God. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I think our challenge has always been to know how to go to him, how to worship him. How do you develop a personal knowledge with a supreme being like that? And I guess that is the, the thing that I think people battle with all around the world. So I grew up in a culture that does not really acknowledge Christ as the means to the Father. So it's always funny when you, <clears throat> when you tell people that the majority of the African continent has no trouble with God. They only have a problem with Jesus. They, huh. they don't understand huh. the redemption equation. Where does he come in? Why is he necessary? Uh, what would be the difficulty of us finding another avenue to reach to God? Hmm. and reconciling that with the gospel. So you find that the emphatic message of Christ, that I'm the way and I'm the door, uh, then becomes a, a conflict to, to the things that I was raised up in. I was raised to believe that uh, your ancestors, when we pass, we go to, back to God. Huh. And when we go back to God, then whoever died in your family earlier, in your generations should be the better advocate for you to God than somebody who was born somewhere whose story I have no relationship with and how they become my advocate in the presence of a supreme being like God. That's complicated. So basically wow. that's my story. That's, that's uh, the heritage that the bulk of the continent of Africa actually struggles with. Huh. Uh, and I think that it's a very powerful lie <laughs> that the enemy sold for us to really look at Christ as, uh, imagine, imagine, imagine a people that feel like God is okay, we have no problem with him, but this Jesus, let's leave him alone. But naturally, you miss the path completely. Yeah. And uh, then you have the deception that may be our way of doing it and the way which we created, which we conveniently feel is the best way to approach God should work for us. So at the end of the day, where does that bring us? we find ourselves in a continent that is lost without knowing Christ uh, as Savior. And uh, this is the thing that I really believe today that the preaching of the gospel, the proclamation of Christ and Him only crucified, uh, the message that we carry in every home for Christ, that it's actually a beautiful thing that we talk about Jesus to be the Lord of every household because that's what the world really needs. And for anything that families and couples and people have put their hope in, the standard, and we're not, we, we, we are kind of like making people aware that your belief in God is fine because that's the truth. There is a real supreme being, but maybe the avenue that you think you approach him by is not the correct one because there is one mediator between God and man. And so that's the message that I came to, to realize. But I think that I struggled a lot in my earlier years because of what I was taught to believe that could God really be interested in me personally? Right. Could salvation become a reality for me? Could what we read about Calvary 
have any real application to an African living in a forgotten village, which as I always wow. uh, joke that I doubt my village, if you can find it on Google, I because <laughs> it's like in the middle of nowhere where there's just no chance. And I was baptized in the most dirty waters anybody can ever think of. <laughs> that you would wonder whether, is that baptism valid enough to actually give eternal hope to someone? But hey, that is the real story. Here I am. Jesus is truly the savior of the world. And he died for all mankind. And when the scriptures say, whosoever, that's the strength that drives us to know that we can proclaim this hope to every man on earth. And if they put their trust and faith in Christ, they can find the same redemptive promise that scripture gives. That's right. Yeah. Cleopas, tell us a little bit more for our audience is coming from a lot of different backgrounds. Yeah. And you're talking about growing up in a village yeah. that's not even on the maps. Yeah. And you're you're speaking to even the, the kind of characteristics of your baptism. But yeah. how was Christ carried to you yeah. in that really, really remote context or that really yeah. isolated context? How how did you first Christ break into the story yeah. of Cleopas Chitapa? Yeah. So <clears throat> So here we are. The knowledge of God, like I said, was always common knowledge. I, I've always believed in the Ecclesiastes passage. There was always eternity in the hearts of people. Yeah, that's right. But um, but bringing Christ to a person um, who lives in our part of the world is probably, like I say, the tricky part because of the fact that you have to argue with the point of making them realize that uh, your parents were no different from you. They don't have the ability to actually right. redeem you because they were equally sinners like you You are. Right. And then bring the promise of Scripture, what huh. the Bible promises through Christ. Uh, and it is that picture that I believe the Lord uses to open the eyes of a person to see that, oh my goodness, uh, you know, the, the comparisons that you, you keep on seeing between the dead and the living. So, you know, Jesus said, why worship the dead in the presence of the living? Right. So you realize that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is an important emphasis in the proclamation of the gospel because of the fact that our culture worships the dead. Huh. And we believe in the yeah. fact that only when you die, you actually become superior and you join the huh. ranks of deity. And then you realize that turning that around and helping people to see that there's actually one savior, one redeemer that God has appointed uh, who becomes uh, the passage to salvation for all of us. That is actually the eye opener. But I, I really believe, uh, you know, I, I think we were talking earlier on about the fact that we just finished um, a, a summit on Islamic evangelism across Africa, huh. where we were talking about Islam, Hinduism, and uh, maybe walking through all the complexities of huh. bringing the gospel to people that were actually born and raised in this culture. And quite honestly, I, I shared the story because I, I, I saw me a few years ago, I visited the Gambia, yeah. uh, visiting our ministry. And I was shocked. One of our brothers, our Gambia director, is probably the most successful person in bringing more Muslims to Jesus Christ than any other. But his story is mainly because he was born in Islam. He was actually being prepared, training as an imam. So this is really someone who was very well schooled. How hard is it to tell a man in that kind of scenario that Jesus Christ is, is, That's right. is Lord. And um, so you realize, well, apart from any other assumption that I'm going to make a very compelling argument, there's also the grace of God that you should appeal to. So talk to the Muslim about God before you talk talk to the Mus to the to God about a Muslim before you talk to the Muslim about God nice. because you really need that covering of that grace and the illumination of the spirit of God for them to even pay attention to the details of what you will be talking about I find that with a lot of affinity to the complexities of the African religion but I think as you walk through it you realize that okay it's mainly a religion that actually worships the dead so if, huh. if you deal with those issues and you, 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 you make people see the fact that we serve a real living savior who rose from the dead and he conquered death. And then, then practical life experiences. This is where being born in the culture also helps. Right. One of the great things we celebrate in Everyone for Christ is our idea of raising indigenous people to reach their own country. That's right. Part of what it benefits in the communication of the gospel, it bridges the cultural gap. 
so that some other nuances that you would not understand in a second or third culture, they are easy to understand because the person really lives in, in them. And uh, by way of understanding how empty the African religion is, how it doesn't have anything else except cycles of misery and rituals that you just keep on running with. And the fact that it doesn't put any other better example in front of you except one of your ancestors who probably had a miserable life himself. Right. And then suddenly right. he's supposed to be like God to you at the present moment. So those are the things where when you then make a comparison with Christ himself and you, right. you make people know and you, you teach there is no other name that was given under the sun through which men can be saved yeah. except Jesus Christ. And then, then emphasize sometimes the, 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 the argument is usually trying to put uh, redemption in sections like no what saves Americans could not be the same way that saves Africans right then so you have to bring in a clear argument on how universal the death of Jesus on the cross is right and how much it is applicable which is actually the joy we celebrate here we are in Brazil and the same gospel that saves men here it's the same one that yeah, serves men in the Sudan, the same message that serves people in Australia, the same message that serves people somewhere in South Africa. How can that be? Because the death of Christ is universal. That's and right. it has application in every culture across the globe, whosoever, and the scripture always, under the sun. There is no other name that was given under the sun. And I always start sometimes by saying, are you still under the sun? If you are, then I can assure <laughs> you that this message is for you. Because Jesus' salvation applies to every single human being on the planet. And, uh, and, and I think reflecting on, on, on those things. And also, you know, one of the things that is amazing is when you look at every other tradition, even religion of the world, uh, I, I, I tell my story that I used to live with a Hindu who was my neighbor some years ago and uh, we argue about faith and, uh, and we, we wouldn't bring each other anyway except to say this is how I look at it and he would also tell me about all the incarnation stuff and all but one day we were closing gates together and we met hey hey how are you doing he said to me Clopas there's something I never told you about throughout the time we were arguing about faith he said at least even though I am a Hindu, but I want you to know that there's almost, we are all agreeable, even in my own religion, that only Christianity has an intelligent explanation concerning human redemption. That guy did not know. Wow. Human, right? That's <laughs> because such a big when statement. you when you come to look at all these other faiths, how does a man get saved? Yeah. What is what is how does a man actually get saved? Tell me the whole narrative. But when you come to the gospel, it's so clear. Wow. The fallen state of man, God working out salvation, sending a redeemer in the form of his own son, perfect, righteous, sinless, to die on your behalf. The whole idea of substitution theology where we talk about the fact that since we could not fulfill the righteous demands of God, we needed another savior and a second Adam. The first one lost it. The second right. one regained it on our behalf. I mean, you can follow this whole thread of the yeah, story yeah, yeah, of salvation, yeah. and it makes sense. But when it comes to my religion, I can't explain salvation. <laughs> For the most part, sometimes I can probably make an argument on a good sleep, but it even is more horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> on a good what sleep. is it? How does a man ever get saved? And quite honestly, you can never explain salvation on the basis of the African religion. I mean, that's just such a profound, I mean, you just gave like a master class yeah. in a lot of ways on kind of the spiritual condition yeah. of Africa yeah. and yours, I mean, kind of implied there's, this is your spiritual condition yeah. growing up. If we pivot just a little bit to um, thinking about cr global Christianity, world yeah. Christianity right now, um, Africa today, almost 800 million Christians live yeah. in Africa. That's that makes Africa, Africa has more Christians than any other continent That's true. in the entire planet today. And so yeah. there's, there's the rapid <laughs> expansion of the Christian faith across Africa yeah. is, 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 is untouched by any other part of the planet today. Yeah. And so when we look, uh, just simply, we look at the facts of what Christianity yeah. looks like today, it's impossible to not talk about, yeah. talk about Africa. Yeah. And I've had, I've had numerous conversations with you yeah. before along these, along these lines, but when you... 
How would you describe African Christianity yeah. today, 2023? What does African Christianity look like? And maybe a secondary question would be, yeah. how will that change? How will Africans, Africa's role in the growth of Christianity, how will that change Christianity as a whole yeah. as, it, as it continues to expand? Yeah. <clears throat> well, it's a, it's a beautiful time in the history of the continent that we can say God is truly moving across the continent. And... Uh, the gospel is moving across the continent in amazing ways. I think obviously like you, you make reference to some of our previous conversations. We realize that some of this development is primarily uh, in the post-independent Africa. Right, post, uh, you're talking yeah. post-colonial. Post-colonial, yeah. Place, nations yeah. that were co colonized, colonized and now free. Self-governing. Yeah, self-governing. And those nations, <clears throat> I think... It, it, the reforms were not just political, but there was also a real look at the worship. Right. Uh, and, but the beauty of it is also a realization that Christ became the Christ of Africa too. We, we, began, awesome. to, we began to identify with the provisions of redemption in a more personal way. In other words, we're not looking at an imported Jesus. We're no longer looking at him as a distant Middle Eastern guy who was just introduced to us. Yeah. But somehow we began to realize that we were there at the cross. <laughs> when he died, we were part and parcel of the amazing salvation story. And when he said, it is finished, he was talking about us yeah. and all our past, all our struggles yeah. and everything else. There are a lot of other things today that, that people have to look at the Christian faith in a more... Oh, first, we are a younger generation that is a very inquiring generation. You mean in, you're talking about in Africa? Africa, the whole Africa continent, 65%. The whole, percent yeah, say that, our, give that statistic. Yeah, the, it's like 65% of the entire continent is still under the age of 25. Wow, So 65% <laughs> yeah, of the entire continent. Of the entire continent yeah. is under the, the age, age of 25. Of 25. Yeah. So we wow. are the youngest continent on the planet at the present moment. And these are young people, the inquiring minds. They are seeking for wow. answers. They are living in a global village today where the traffic of information is worldwide. Right. They're making comparisons. They're right. trying to understand <clears throat> why, are our, why are our systems the way they are? Why do we have to live under the, this kind of a worldview and how pro-development is, is it? To be, to be honest with you, these are issues, Tana, that people don't talk about uh, at length, but they have, to me, they are so central to the whole story. So not, not long ago, I spent a lot of time talking about this, and I say, there's not a single civilization on the planet that is worth admiring today whose foundations were not scriptural. That's right. As long as the Bible was not the basis of your civilization. Now, Sometimes when I say that, people say to me, oh, no, 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 brother, how could that be true? Look at China. Right. <laughs> and I say, are you ready to go and live there? <laughs> yeah. And when I say that, I say, oh, oh, no, no, no. Well, I can just visit, but I'm not. Right. So I'm saying, why do you not go there? So this question became a big question during what was called the Arab Spring. You remember the time? Yeah, when of all the And the question was, all these Muslims that are fleeing countries like Libya, Iraq, why are they not going to other richer Muslim nations? Why do they want to come to Christian nations? Because here is the truth that they may never talk about publicly, that even though they follow Islam, huh. they still believe that proper justice and fairness is only found in Christian civilizations. So they, they keep wild. flocking to Christian nations. So come on, go to Qatar, go to Saudi Arabia, go to Dubai. All of these nations, Jordan, they are rich. There is a lot of money there. We even marvel at the money that they have. That's right. What, what, are, what do you want in the United States? What do you want in, in Europe? But I tell you the truth that no matter how you look at it, at the end of the day, as, as devoted a Muslim could be, but somewhere at the bottom of his mind, he still knows that I have a better life in a Christian nation, better chance of proper justice in a Christian nation, fairness and a better future for my children and access to true equal rights and human rights in a Christian right. nation than any other. So when you look at that, you tend to realize that, oh, they may not follow the faith, but they still realize that right. uh, this is uh, the best civilizations and all of the fair, better civilizations on the planet. We're all built on scripture, foundations of the Bible. So let me interrupt you then. <laughs> yeah. It means we have this massive growth of Christianity in Africa. Yeah. 
And many of the nations, if not all of the nations in Africa, very yeah. few of them yeah. have their foundations based on scripture. on scripture. That's right. And so do you believe that there's a tension that exists exactly. between the people and their governments? Yeah. And do you see that, that maybe that those the governments in the years to come will become more biblically based? Yeah. So th this is actually the pleasure that we have in proclaiming the gospel, in making people see that we're not only just talking about a message that is changing the eternal hope right. of a generation. We are also building even the political and economic future of the nations. Because the beautiful thing with so many younger people embracing the gospel, today Africa's churches are packed with millions of young people. And that's a, that's a very comforting thing. We are instilling the correct values, a sense of justice, and the proper way in which a brand new community that has to be, and not only that, these are the future leaders of the country. And if yeah. their value system is based on, uh, on, on, on the Bible and a realization of justice and fairness, we have a better chance of actually reconstructing a continent. <laughs> we right. actually build it on wow. the foundations of scripture. So most of this, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a funny thing when you think of some of the wars that are fought on our continent are totally barbaric, quite unreasonable that you actually ask yourself, you've been fighting for how many years? Yeah, <laughs> you right. know, The other day, I remember talking to a brother from Sudan and he said, we've been fighting for 50 years. For what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's so stupid. At the end of the day, when you hear the actual story behind it and all these thousands and hundreds of thousands of people that had been killed over something that is so stupid that you can't even believe, like, you killed each other over that. But all this barbarism and a, a very uh, foggy and very, oh, uh, oh, very, very, very wrong worldview that people have. They, they still places where treatment of women, treatment of children, treatment of people, treatment of the disabled. It's all based on superstition and some of the traditional things. What does the gospel bring? Liberty, freedom. And uh, the gospel takes out all the fog and all the mysticism and puts only God at the center of life. And a simple journey of realizing you walk with him. I, I've always said, if it becomes extremely complicated, it's not Christianity, because Paul calls it this simple faith. <laughs> so our faith makes life very, very simple. The way how we live with our children, the way how we relate with our families, the way how we actually govern our institutions and everything else. So our, the struggle in on our continent are all these uh, webs and things that are, entangled in our politicians, which actually arise from their heritage and their past. Yeah. So they go to school, but these things, they can't conquer them. Yeah. And this is the, the amazing thing about scripture when Paul says, be ye transformed by the renewal of your, Mind. your minds, which actually tells us that scripture does not come. We focus so much on the fact that you're supposed to go to heaven. That's not the only thing that yeah. we benefit from scripture. Scripture creates the best citizenry. Yeah. That even in the, I've always often said to people that if God would say today that there is no heaven, I was joking, I would still remain a Christian because it's still the best way to live this planet. It's That's still right. the best way to think as a human being. If When you apply all the biblical principles full circle around everything that has to do with you, you will discover a, a level of sobriety and a better citizenry, better than anything else that anyone can ever give you. And And I still feel like uh, and this, this is the other dimension sometimes. So this was a beautiful thing. Even in Madagascar, I was very privileged to be addressing a meeting packed with a lot of government officials. And I was actually saying to them, we come as everyone for Christ in your nation, not just to take people to heaven, but to build a brand new country for you. That's because amazing. only the foundations of scripture can turn this nation around. And when you look at any other nation that has become a focus of our admiration, and I, I, I walk the journey of the United States a little bit. I talk a lot about England. I, I find England being one of my closest examples that I always find like, wow, is it possible? So I was, recently I was telling this story about King James. You know, I, I make reference to the story of the real king of England, King James, and how Great Britain changed when he came and he became the monarch. What is the greatest thing that he did? Well, authorized the reading of scripture made and gave an instruction hmm. that I want the closest translation into English of the scriptures so that every person who lives in Great Britain can read what? Huh. The Bible. And when you watch the moral compass of the nation turning around, 
So I tell a story one time, I walked through the Westminster Abbey with a, a royal historian. And when we came to the grave of King James, and he started talking about the changes that happened. He, oh, it changed everything. I spent quite a while standing there. And now I say, now I know why the first pages of the King James Bible are written, the authorized versions, <laughs> as much as we laugh wow. about. Who authorized? Oh, is, this is the guy who authorized. But you know, in the times of King James, there's a statement that was flying all over Great Britain that says there were only two books in England during the times of King James, the Bible and Shakespeare. And the saying says, England, made Shakespeare, but the Bible made England. Wow. So basically, when you look at it, you see a nation reconstructed by the foundations of scripture, bringing in civility, decency. And most of the things that we admire about these civilizations, we think that they happened by chance. No, they didn't happen by chance. They happened because the moral fiber and the foundations of the culture were built by scripture. And that's the message Africa needs to understand today. It's incredible. That we can rebuild this continent. We can actually change this continent if God's way. But here we are. We struggle with this. We have other schools of thought that are thinking, oh, no, 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 no. We need new universities. We need, uh, no, even AI will not change Africa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, AI, okay. It's, <laughs> it's only the Bible, the scripture. scripture. Everything else comes to complement that, that transformation, transformation, but the change must be a change of heart and mind. Right. And if that change happens, the rest changes. So I want to, I mean, I want to summarize even what you just said and ask you just point blank. Yeah. I think what I hear you say is that at the core, you know, in post-colonial yeah. Africa, yeah. where the need for development and reconstruction and healing yeah. is so great, yeah. that you see the gospel yeah. as the engine it of is. transformation and development. Yeah. Yeah. In, in a critical way. Yeah. Would you say that that brings hope to Africa? Are you hopeful about, about, about yeah. the future of Africa? Because you can yeah. see the prolif 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 I can't say that one. Yeah, exactly. The Christian faith yeah. e expanding yeah. in the way that it is. Does that bring yeah. hope? Exactly. So that brings a lot of hope. Why? Because the gospel never fails. So you see, you see so this is, this is the confidence of the apostle Paul. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? It's the power unto salvation. Wow. There has never been a place anywhere where God's word was proclaimed and it failed. Never. And it's incorruptible. So it's a seed that lasts forever. Sometimes we take the gospel, and this is actually the struggle we have, because we preach the gospel and we see nothing. Right. And we say, oh, maybe, <laughs> maybe it didn't work. Right. We, did it. we preached it. We have five crusades here. Yeah. We did this campaign, and things are still as bad as they used to be. Well, and I, and I always say... I think about, I find comfort in the words of Jeremiah. And he asks this question and he says, and the Lord says, is not my word like a hammer or like a fire, says the Lord. And I always say, you know, I think I take that analogy very seriously and I think about a hammer and I say, hey, take a hammer and he hit something. First time, you probably see nothing. Second time, maybe even the 10th time, you may not see them. The 15th time, a little crack begins to happen. So you must always understand that's actually how the word of God works. And the fact of the matter is, don't ever ignore even that little crack that has happened because the whole thing will fall apart anyway. It's so amazing. this is the mystery and the beauty of the gospel that for any time when God's word has been sown, there has never been a waste. So I see Africa changing and I, 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 I have nothing else to offer to people more than the fact that preach the gospel and keep on preaching the gospel. And I find the emphasis of Paul when he says, preach the gospel in season, out of season, keep on preaching the gospel. So this is all that we will do across the continent of Africa. We're not even looking for a new message. We're not even thinking there is anything else that will come by that will actually replace the effectiveness of the gospel when it comes to its transformative power. Um, I have no other story to tell except my own story. And I can think of the fact that if the gospel could take me where I was and Jesus could make the transformation and create a brand new story out of my circumstances like he did, he can do that to anybody else. So I, it's not something that anyone can argue with me because I have a, I'm a living example. Of right, that right. Story. So I know what it does. And I know that God's word really works all the time. So I don't see Africa will never remain the same as long as we really understand
the, the fact that God should come at the center of our continent's agenda of transformation. Nice. Yeah. So, I mean, you're speaking to the way that, that Christ yeah. and the gospel is transforming Africa really from the inside out. Yeah. It's probably decades yeah. of transformation that we'll see exactly. moving forward. I want to return to an earlier question that I yeah. asked that we never got to, yeah. which is how will African Christianity yeah. change the yeah. world beyond Africa? Yeah. I wonder if you have any insight. I, I failed yeah, to yeah. introduce you properly. No, no. <laughs> this is and Cleopas oversees, I want to say 50 plus nations. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a, 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 in, a all across Africa. Africa. So your perspective of Africa and African yeah. Christianity is incredibly credible. It's yeah. very unique. It's very nuanced. You're a very nuanced individual, yeah. but you're, you're seeing African Christianity, I think, in a very clear way yeah. uh, that many people will not. <clears throat> but you're also seeing the world in a clear way. I mean, yeah. we're sitting here in Brazil and yeah. we're having meetings with leaders all across Latin America. Right. How do you see Africa changing global Christianity yeah. in, the, in the decades and the dec decades and centuries yeah. to come? Well, here's the thing. Sometimes when, when people talk about this amazing, phenomenal uh, thing happening across the continent. Uh, I celebrate that. I know the challenges of it too. Um, the purity of the gospel. It's going to be hard to preserve that. And, um, and, and the real fervency of the gospel, keeping it is something else, which is basically some of the struggles that I see, especially in continents like Europe, yeah. where the gospel used to be everything and yeah. people have slowly drifted away. So it's, those, it's learning those things that should help us to understand um, that we need to preserve the, the fervency of the gospel, the power of the gospel, purity of the, uh, gospel. the purity of the gospel. And it's, 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 it's not easy because of the fact that one of the easiest things that the devil, I believe, he does is that, let's say he fails to stop the movement of the gospel, then the other way is just to corrupt the gospel. Right. So when he does that, then naturally, the outcome is not as expected. I believe that our continent will become uh, the very last bastion of the Christian faith and it will bring hope. And, 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 I, and I think that the transformation should be a testimony for the rest of the world that if a continent like Africa could change um, and if we even see a future where leadership actually embrace uh, the gospel, you know, that whole thing where the Bible says, when the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. There's something about power and authority when it's entrusted in people that have the fear of God in them. Yeah. There's really something. And there's something about when the justice system is applied based on the giver of the law, God himself. And those things, they make all the difference there is. And it, it, the, the difference that it creates, it's undeniable. So I see Africa giving birth to a huge number of missionaries in future that will just tell the world about their story. I see the actual transformation huh. of the continent, not only just from a spiritual perspective, but even from an economic, political, and social uh, dimension because of the fact that the gospel has the power to do that. But I do not take lightly the burden that we have in terms of preserving the period yeah. of the gospel. We right. have, uh, and part of it is also because of the fact that there are elements from our past that try to creep into the gospel. It's, it's yeah, that's old. right. Yeah. Syncretism. <laughs> yeah, that's, exactly. a, that's a term that many, I mean, <laughs> yeah. some would know and some no, wouldn't know, but yeah. the idea that Christianity would begin to blend exactly. with other local religions or, or past yeah, religions. Past, and those things creep into the faith, corrupt the view in which we we look at uh, the Christian faith or create our own visions of the Christian faith. So these are some of the things, and this is where sometimes I also think that the levels of knowledge in the West and the lessons that we can learn yeah. from, the, from the West are extremely uh, important. So this morning I was having a conversation with my brother Jose about the fact that it's, it's still an issue where we need to promote scholarship among uh, Christian leadership, training. Yeah. This is the beauty of what we do in Everyone for Christ. We, we value training a, a lot. So we are saying we're not only thinking about planting churches, creating Christ groups, but we're also thinking about the quality of the leadership that takes over the leadership uh, of these uh, yeah. churches in the future. So I think years ago, one of our brilliant theologians warned that the danger in Africa is building a church that is 10 kilometers long, but one inch deep. 
And yeah. that's actually talking about the issue that we need to worry about depth. We need to worry about scholarship. We need to worry about the place of scripture in the face of a growing religion because sometimes we can just grow in any direction and the enemy takes advantage of it. Yeah. But I think we have a, an amazing future and I'm so excited to see that we are still at a place where uh, the faith is becoming the defense for everything that we still don't struggle a lot to just tell people that they should come to Christ. We still have open doors in some of the highest institutions of the world yeah. on our continent, universities, colleges, schools are still open, bring the gospel. Sometimes some of our leadership take their tons and tons of Christian literature yeah. and make no mistake about it, the seed is being sown and yeah. the difference is amazing. Okay, your, your input and your insight is just so, so, so valuable. Yeah. I wanna ask you one final question um, just about that I, I ask on every one of these podcasts. Okay. It has to do with the terminology. I'm using the terminology carry to carry Christ. Yeah. And you, you're, you're, you've been around, you know that this is terminology that I love, that I'm drawn into. Okay. I just love this, this, this picture. When I say, when I use that term carry Christ, or when I say, what is carry Christ? Yeah. What does that mean to you? I think it's, it's, for all things, I think it's it's the, you know, when 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 Jesus comes into a person's life, I would think that there's no way that people cannot see it. <laughs> so Paul uses the word aroma, the aroma of yeah, Christ, that's right. the fact that there is something about our our being the redeemed that actually becomes um, an attraction and something that people and for for the most part, I I, I feel like. I think probably part of the burden that probably you have also is the fact that it's not only just about the lip service or the talk about the Christian faith. That's right. But it's the evidence of it being visible in our lives right. on a daily basis. And that is a stronger sermon more than anything else. That's right. And I think, well, it's, there could be a broader sense of people literally taking the gospel or carrying the message of Jesus Christ and him being the very person. It, it, you know, the, the thing that we have to realize is the fact that the whole Christian experience should not be just like an ideological change where we're right. talking about alternative philosophy. That's right. What, what is it about? But it should be an encounter with a person and a relationship with a deity and an encounter with a real redeemer and a relationship with a personal savior. And I think that for the most part, that's what has made uh, the difference and probably that's the most fulfilling part in preaching the gospel. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it always makes me feel interested when I think about the fact that I can go to a place, there are some places around the continent that I've only gone once, probably I'll never go back there again. But I try to identify with the Apostle huh. Paul when I think about that and I think about his message to the Ephesians uh, when he says, I'll never see you again. Uh, this is the last sermon. Mm -hmm. And I've always asked myself, could it be, what would you say to people? Uh, what, uh, what, if you knew for certain that you are talking to them and how can you guarantee for certain that even if I never see you again, but I'm absolutely certain you have the hope of eternity and I will see you at home. How can, how can you be absolutely sure about that? And it sounds like a simple thing, but I think this is where Paul was, where he mm. really knew that, like he uses the words in Galatians, till Christ was formed in you. He yeah. was so sure yeah. that it was just not an alternative concept or Beautiful. idea of thinking, but now you carry him within you and he is fully formed mm. inside you. And wherever you go, even when I'm no longer there, they will see him. That's and awesome. That's the, that's the commission. Amen. <laughs> this is just, you're so eloquent, Cleo, because yeah. like I talked to you for, for hours, but your, your depth of understanding, I think, of sociology and yeah. history, but also scripture just makes you so interesting. Uh, to be you. with. You're also, no. to me, just an important leader in our context, always, yeah. because you bring a uniquely African perspective. And I think it's important yeah. that as the West, as, as the global South, which is yeah. Africa, Latin America, and, and Asia, yeah. as those, as Christianity grows, grows. in these places, yeah. they, they're going to, their voice needs yeah. to be amplified. The, amplify, the, the church's voice needs to be amplified even above that of the West sometimes. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a Westerner and I, I know 
for a fact that we like to hear our voice sometimes uh, above the rest. But we we need we need your voice, and so oh, I'm. Yeah. Grateful for you taking the time. I'm no. grateful that we didn't we didn't get devoured by ants. No. Um, I've definitely gotten no, some man. creepy crawlers on me. So but... always enjoy talking to you, Tana. It's always a joy. <laughs> thank, thank you, Cleopas. Bless you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for joining us today on the Redeeming Missions podcast. If you like what you heard, we encourage you to visit everyhome.org slash redeeming missions to find all past episodes and learn more about supporting the efforts of every home to carry Christ to everyone, everywhere, in every generation. Echoing the prayer of St. Patrick, Christ with us, Christ before us, Christ behind us, Christ in us. Let us carry Christ to our world. Until next time.